It is the 19th of the 10th, 2013. This is a story out called uh, The Ocean is Broken, published on the Newcastle Herald. A story about the Pacific Ocean. Knowing what we know now about Fukushima and what's going on in the Pacific Ocean, this is definitely a story that needs to be heard. Ivan McFadden is the captain aboard the Funnel Web, and this is his story. It was the silence that made this voyage different from all those before it. Not the absence of sound, exactly. The wind still whipped and the sails whistled in the rigging. The waves still sloshed against the fiberglass hull. And there were plenty of other noises. Muffled thuds and bumps and scrapes as the boat knocked against pieces of debris. What was missing was the cries of the seabirds, which on all previous similar voyages had surrounded the boat. The birds were missing because the fish were missing. Exactly ten years before, when Newcastle yachtsman Ivan McFadden had sailed exactly the same course from Melbourne to Osaka, all he had to do was to catch fish from the ocean between Brisbane and Japan was to throw out a bait line. There was not one of those 28 days on the portion of the trip that we didn't catch a good-sized fish to cook up and eat with some rice, McFadden recalled. But this time, on the whole leg of the sea journey, the total catch was two. No fish, no birds, hardly a sign of life at all. In the years gone by, I've gotten used to all the birds and their noises, he said. They'd be following the boat, sometimes resting on the mast and taking off again. You'd see flocks of them wheeling over the surface of the sea in the distance, feeding on the, the pilkards. But in March and April this year, only science, silence and desolation surrounded his boat, Funnel Webb, as it sped across the surface of a haunted ocean. North of the equator and above New Guinea, the ocean racers saw a big fishing boat working a reef in the distance. All day it was there, tra trawling back and forth. It was a big ship. Like a mother ship, he said. And all night it worked too, under bright floodlights. And in the morning, McFadden was awoken by his crewmen calling out urgently that the ship had launched a speedboat. Obviously, I was worried we were, in, we were unarmed and pirates were a real worry in these waters. I thought if these guys had weapons, then we were in deep trouble. But they weren't pirates, not in the conventional sense, at least. The speedboat came alongside and the Malaysian men aboard offered gifts of fruit and jars of jam and preserves. And they gave us five big sugar bags full of fish, he said. They were good, big fish of all kinds. Some were fresh, but others had obviously been in the sun for a while. We told them there was no way we could possibly use all those fish. There were just two of us, with no real place to store or keep them. They shrugged and told us to tip them overboard. That's what they would have done with them anyway, they said. They told us that this was just a small fraction of the day's catch, that they were only interested in the tuna, and to them everything else was rubbish. It was all killed, all dumped. They just trawled the reef day and night and stripped, at, at, stripped it of everything. McFadden felt sick in his heart. That was one fishing boat among countless more working unseen beyond the horizon, many of them doing the exact same thing. No wonder the sea is dead. No wonder his baited lines caught nothing. There was nothing to catch. If that sounds depressing, it only gets worse. The next leg of the voyage was from Osaka to San Francisco, and for most of the trip, desolation was tinged with nauseous horror and a degree of fear. After we left Japan, it felt as if the ocean itself was dead, McFadden said. We hardly saw any living things. We saw one whale sort of rolling helplessly on the surface with what looked like a big tumor on its head. It was pretty sickening. I've done a lot of miles on the ocean in my life and I'm used to seeing turtles, dolphins, sharks, and big flurries of feeding birds. But this time, for 3,000 nautical miles, there was nothing alive to be seen. In the place of the missing life was garbage in astounding volumes. Part of it was the aftermath of the tsunami that hit Japan a couple of years ago. The wave came in over the land, picked up an unbelievable load of stuff and carried it out to sea. And it's still out there, everywhere you look. Ivan's brother, Glenn, 
who boarded at Hawaii for the run to the United States marveled at the thousands on thousands of yellow plastic buoys, the huge tangles of synthetic rope, fishing lines, and nets, pieces of uh, styrofoam by the million, and slicks of oil and petrol everywhere. Countless hundreds of wit wooden power lines are out there, snapped off by the killer wave and still trailing their wires in the middle of the sea. In the years gone by, when you were beclaimed by lack, by lack of wind, you just started your engine and motor on, Ivan said. Not this time. In a lot of places, we couldn't start our motor for fear of entangling the propeller in the mass pieces of rope and cable. That's an unheard of situation out on the ocean. If we decided to motor, we couldn't do it at night, only in the daytime with a lookout on the bow watching for rubbish. On the bow in the waters above Hawaii, you can see right down to the depths. I could see that the debris isn't just on the surface, it's all the way down. And it's all sizes, from soft drink bottles to pieces the size of a big car or truck. We saw a factory chimney sticking out of the water with some kind of boiler thing still attached to the surface. We saw a big container type thing just rolling over and over and on the waves. We were reaving around these pieces of debris like it was sailing through a garbage tip. Below the decks you were constantly hearing things against the hull and you were constantly afraid of hitting something really big. As it was, the hull was scratched and dented all over the place from bits and pieces we never saw. Plastic was ubiquitous, bottles, bags, every kind, throwaway domestic item you can imagine, from broken chairs and dustpans to toys and utensils. And something else. The boat's vivid yellow paint, never faded by sun or sea in years gone past, reacted with, with something in the water off Japan, losing its sheen in a strange and unprecedented way. Back in Newcastle, Ivan McFadden is still coming to terms with the shock and horror of the voyage. The ocean is broken, he said, shaking his head in stunned disbelief. Recognizing the problem is vast and no organization or governments appear to have a particular interest in doing anything about it, McFadden is looking for ideas. He plans to lobby government ministers hoping they might help. More immediately, he will approach the organizers of the Australian major ocean races trying to enlist yachtists to an international scheme that uses volunteer yachtsmen to monitor debris and marine life. McFadden signed up to this scheme while he was in the U.S. responding to an approach by U.S. academics who asked yachts to fill in daily survey forms and collect samples for radiation testing. A significant concern in the wake of the tsunami and consequent nuclear power station failure in Japan. I asked them why they didn't push for a fleet to go out and clean up the mess, he said. But they said they calculated that the environmental damage from burning the fuel to do that job would be worse than just leaving the debris there. The insanity continues. Enjoy where you can.